Uh, these are chapters from the book God Dictates, a name that I mention so often. Um, all of my videos, except one, I'm reading from that book, or, or the second book, The Life of God's Righteous Servant, which is my life, Keith Ellis McCarty. And I said, I know all these things I've been posting. Uh, he taught me. He taught me. And he had me type it. You know, he said, you know, he, he might say, go to the Jewish virtual library. Read everything they have on Holy Spirit. And, of course, I found out right away, Judaism doesn't believe he is a person. Well, when the Spirit of God alighted upon me under Isaiah 11, I knew right then he's a person because he's talking to me. And God was in him. Now, I, I've explained that concept several on several videos. I won't go back into it. But um, the short answer is it happened with Ezekiel. Uh, there's a verse that says, God was telling Ezekiel to get up on his feet. And then Ezekiel says, at that moment, a spirit entered into me. And I could hear God's words. He could not hear God until the spirit entered him. And God was in his spirit. And it doesn't say that in Isaiah 11. Uh, verse 1 and 2 was Hamashiach, the anointed one. It just says the Spirit of God alighted upon him. And it, it doesn't go on to say, and God was in his spirit. That's because it's a proof of who I am, that I know these things, that I can find them in other sections of the Hebrew Bible. So he just, he just you know, uh, he, he left that out. And when he, he only mentions the angel of his presence and the Holy Spirit uh, as a person one time. And that's in Isaiah 63. He didn't put it in the Torah. Why? It's a teaching of mine. It's something new. It explains things. Uh, such as Ezekiel saying, when the Spirit entered me, I could hear God's words. God is in his Spirit. And he actually tells you that in the Torah. He told the Israelites, I'm sending my angel before you. An angel and Holy Spirit, same thing. Same person. Do not disobey him. He will not forgive you. Because my name, Hashem, is in him. So he does mention it. But you gotta, you, you really got to hunt out. I don't see anyone in Judaism talking about an angel with him. Because if they did, they know. If God spoke to Jacob and changed his name to Israel, that means he's with that man that he's wrestling with. And where God is, the angel is. So that man is the man and divine beings. They're controlling him. They're telling him what to do. Go wrestle with Jacob. I got things to say to him. So you have God speaking. And once you know that, there's an angel of his presence. If his presence is there to speak, the angel's there. He created an angel. And for that angel's body, he did not give him a human form and wings. No his body is the spirit of God itself. That's why he's spirit and an angel. And he is a person. He's, he's a great person. Uh, totally different from God, but they get along perfectly, as you might imagine, because God created him to be his constant companion and to assist, to assist in talking to prophets. It just helps. Um, so that's the backdrop on that. And, and Isaiah 11 says, the Spirit, the Spirit of God alit upon him, alighted upon him. Okay, Ezekiel makes it clear and enters into you. It's like uh, the presence of God is, is his mind. And just like us, where his mind is, that's, that's where we feel we are. And, you know, it's not made up of spirit. It's got its own components from the unseen realm of God. And then you have the spirit, who's a person, an angel, and his spirit is totally different elements, but like two clouds in the unseen. They have drifted together. And that is how God is in his spirit. For that matter, his spirit is in God. 
So it's a spirit of energy and God energy. And that's not pointed out, but you can see by all my references, it's there if you know what to look for. And it's a proof of who I am. Anyway, uh, here's three very short chapters that are very interesting, but they're so short, I'm going to go through all of them. God creates and he forms. The God of Israel comes to the earth to dwell with his anointed one. That would be me. And the Jewish people in Israel, as he once came to dwell with Moses. Moses was a man of divine being too. That's, that's how God could walk amongst the tents of the Israelites. They had a lit upon and entered Moses. Well, the Spirit had, and God was in His Spirit. They just control you. They can control your thoughts, your physical movements, your very words. And He creates the man of Isaiah 53 and forms His righteous servant. Just as he created Jacob, Israel, the Jewish people, and formed Israel for his purposes. He created the universe, the earth, and humanity, including Jacob and the man described in Isaiah 53. He then forms them for his purposes. He formed Israel with covenants and the names Hebrew, Israel, and Jew, and 613 laws that define and refine the Jewish people in the oppression of the world. They've been put through it, and everybody knows it. And it's not just the Holocaust. You know, most people don't know there was programs where they, they, they were told to leave Spain and the Spanish Inquisition. You know, they've been oppressed as a people from day one. But you just can't get rid of them <laughs> because they're tough, because they, they have a history of hard times. And I'm pointing this out because I'm going to get to how he forms me. And it hasn't been easy either. It hasn't been easy by any stretch of the imagination. He forms his righteous servant in what we call, or I call, the fire of refinement with a and the, all these words you can find in 53. With an oppressive judgment of maltreatment, chastisement, punishment, crushing, and bruising. It's a, it, it's a fire refinement by the hand of God. It's not by man. And it's in his words and by his power. Just as he did with Ezekiel. So you can find out, you can... Uh, Ezekiel is the key to understanding Isaiah 53. He went through the fire refinement. The only thing missing is wounding and being crushed with disease that he would offer himself for guilt. But that's what's missing. And he even says it. A, a spirit sees me and I went in bitterness and in the fury of my spirit in the hand of God. Now, he's in the hand of God, and he's bitter and furious. Okay, I've been bitter and furious many a day while I've gone through this. It started 13 years ago when I was 50 years old. I'm um, 63 now. Actually, I just turned 64. Okay, this is a chapter just entitled Hebrew and Jew. And it kind of goes with everything I'm talking about. A fugitive brought the news to Abram the Hebrew, who was dwelling at the Terebinths of Mamre, the Amorite, a kinsman of Eshkol and Aner, these being Abram's uh, allies. That's Genesis chapter 14, verse 13. No one is Hebrew until a fugitive brought the news to Abram the Hebrew. He wasn't born Hebrew. But that's where we got the name Hebrew. In the fortress Shoshana lived a Jew by the name of Mordecai, son of Jair, the son of Shemel, son of Kish, a Benjamite. 
He's a Benjamite. He's not. He, he's not a Judahite. No one is a Jew until Mordecai is described as a Jew. Mordecai the Jew is of the tribe of Benjamin, and his people are the Jews. The name seems to be a form of the word Judah, but the tribe of Judah and the lands allotted to Judah had nothing to do with the word Jew. It is a special word, just as Hebrew is a special word. Words from God. He was having his prophets write this. He had he he told whoever wrote it. Write this down. Abraham the Hebrew. He told somebody else. Mordecai the Jew. In the Bible. Both are simply introduced into God's stories. The names identify God's chosen people throughout the world. Just as religious ritual, faith, and manner of dress identify them. You know who his chosen is? It's the Jews. It was, a long time ago, you would have said, it's the Hebrews. God formed Israel in part to test the world. And the people Israel had to be identifiable. These names and 613 laws did just that, and the world failed. God changing the name Hebrew to a Jew may have had more to do with the Jewish people being in exile than anything else. Shortening Hebrew to Jew to account for marriages outside of the tribes, a dilution of the pure Hebrew blood. And of course, Jew ends in E-W, and so does, so does Hebrew. It's got nothing to do with Jew. I hear that everywhere, everywhere I hear people talking about the source of that name, they say it's because it, it came from Jew. Now they were in exile, and uh, God just introduced it to the story. Uh, I believe it occurred in Persia, uh, which before that was, uh, or today is Iran. Okay, this is, this is the last one, and it's real interesting. The God of Elijah. Now, this is 2 Kings, chapter 2, verse 14. Taking the mantle, which had dropped from Elijah, that's just uh, like a big coat. The mantle, which had dropped from Elijah, he struck the water and said, Where is the Lord? The God of Elijah. So this is Elijah doing that. Um, God had taken Elijah up in the chariots of God to heaven. You know, he's the only person in the Bible who is specifically taken to heaven in the Hebrew Bible. And he returns in the day of the Lord. You gotta ask yourself why. Because you test Elijah with Tell us about heaven. Tell, tell us, tell us about the angel of his presence. And in the book, I actually have a chapter where I detail how he created the very person of uh, the Holy Spirit, the angel of his presence. Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? Elijah, again, the only person in the Hebrew Bible to refer to God as the God of Elijah rather than the God of Israel or the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's not what he said. He said, Where, where's the God of Elijah? Elijah is not an Israelite. He's not a Hebrew. He's not a Jew. He's a Gentile. He's a Tishbite. And an inhabitant. He lives in Ramoth Gilead, of the Gentiles, Arabs and Assyrians, east of the River Jordan. Uh, it's a territory like Moab. Um, it's east of the River Jordan, but it's north of Moab. He has no history, and there are no Tishbites in any of the ancestral trees of the Israelites that are chronicled in the Hebrew Bible. The main references to Elijah, the Tishbite, an inhabitant of Ramon Gilead, 
they don't always mention the inhabitant where he lived, but they, they almost any time you see his name, it says Belteshvite. Uh, and that alone is unusual um, and calls attention to a tribal or clan affiliation from Gilead, east of the River Jordan. And of course, he was taken up in the chariots of God east of the River Jordan. He wasn't in the Promised Land. He was in Gentile lands. So the God of Elijah is the God of a single Gentile because he chose the Jews. Okay, he's not the God of Gentiles. He's not the God of Christians. Certainly not Muslims. He's the God of the Jewish people. Yes, he created everybody. But those are his chosen. That's who he identifies with. The Gentile Elijah, who returns as a Gentile, it turns out, in the day of the Lord. God comes from Adam. Who is this coming from Adam? It is I. You know, it's God talking. God is I. I'm coming from Gentile lands. And as a matter of fact, in the Exodus, um, the Israelites, the slaves, and Moses, and of course God was uh, within Moses and his, with his spirit, um, so he's there too. They weren't allowed to go through Adam. They had to go around. The, whoever the ruler was, and Adam, uh, if you know the story about uh, Jacob and his uh, brother Esau, and how they were always at odds with each other, well, Esau only married Gentile women. So, Edomites are, are always thought of as being Gentiles. Who's this coming from lands of Gentiles? And there's a whole lot more history on them. And, uh, uh, well, actually on a YouTube video I did. And anyway, the Talmud, uh, it said all references to Adam was Rome, Gentiles. And then, and then uh, Christian Rome. And then Rome finally fell, and it's still now a reference to Christianity. First and foremost, the Gentiles. Okay, here's how God had me uh, type it. Adam no longer exists in the day of the Lord, and today we lie within Jordan. God returns coming from a Christian country with a Gentile. The God of Elijah is the God of a single Gentile and the God of all Jews. And even though he created all of humanity, in the day of the Lord, which is here, and I've got plenty of videos on it, it's here, and we know that because of Jeremiah 31. It's here, you know. The, the righteous servant of Isaiah 53, who is the anointed one of Isaiah 11, uh, and I know this to be fact because it's me. You know, I've been going to this fire refinement for 13 years and teaching me. I was an atheist for 50 years. And so God said, let's go to the bookstore and get you a Tanakh. And I said, what's a Tanakh? I didn't have any clue. No religious friends, no religious affiliations. So he taught me everything I know about the Bible, and that includes the Holy Bible, the New Testament. In the day of the Lord, he is again the God of a single Gentile, his righteous servant, the God of the Jewish people, and one Gentile, not the Christians, not the Muslims, or any other religious group. The God of Israel. And keep the Gentile. That's exactly what it is. Anyway, that was really interesting. He taught me all this, and you know, he told me read that, read this, uh, go to your computer, copy and paste that right there. Copy, and you know, he doesn't say copy, copy the third paragraph. He points my head down. His power encircles my body like it did Ezekiel. Of course, of his power. He and my eyes. He can just say copy that. And my head will look down, and my eyes take in what he wants. That's how incredible what I'm going through is. That's the man in Divine Banks, also known as a host.
and the Lord's house. Thanks for listening.